Well, I want us to think just a tad about the Hebrew poetry as we begin our study over uh, the poetic and wisdom books. This lecture is intended to give you just a brief overview of the various literary styles found in Hebrew poetry. So what are the poetic books? When we use the expression poetic, we're referring to the books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Psalms. These are the books of which we are focused upon, which I know you're aware of. Poetry also occurs in many other Old Testament books, but these five books contain a very large portion of Hebrew poetry. And in every poetic book except for Ecclesiastes, poetry provides the predominant literary form. Now, Ecclesiastes nevertheless became associated with poetic books at some time early, probably because of its affinities with Hebrew wisdom literature. The object of this PowerPoint is for us to discover some of the basic characteristics of Hebrew poetry. It's the hope of this lecture that this will help clarify the special contribution that poetic books have made to the Bible into our Christian faith. Now some common characteristics of Hebrew poetry. It should be noted that Hebrew scholars disagree over what exactly constitutes Hebrew poetry. Nevertheless, they agreed that Hebrew poetry typically displays certain characteristics. And some of the most common characteristics are going to be discussed in this lecture. Meter. In, mo in most modern poetry, meter and rhyme play very important roles, especially in English. Each line follows a certain meter accent pattern, and the last words of lines often rhyme. For example, the little poem that you and I are very familiar with, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Well, if you notice the meter and rhyme of this verse here, the first and third lines have four basic accents. Mary had a little lamb, and everywhere that Mary went, the second and fourth lines have three basic accents. Its fleece was white as snow. The second and fourth lines have last words that rhyme, snow, and go. But Hebrew poetry relies more on meter than on rhyme, even though rhyme occurs uh, at different times in the different uh, poems. Now, parallelism. This is said to be the most important aspect of Hebrew poetry. And when parallelism is used, it normally means there's at least two parallel lines of verse. And by that we mean that the second line often complements the first line or vice versa. Most of the time this parallelism idea is more in thought than in rhyme or sound. There are three major types of parallelisms in Hebrew poetry. You have synonymous parallelism, antithetic parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. Now, par synonymous parallelism involves repeating the same thought with similar thoughts. The two lines basically reflect the same idea. Psalm 19, verse 1, says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Proverbs 19, or 9 and 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge is the Holy One, is understanding. In Psalm 15, 1, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, who may live in your holy hill. And so we notice here in Psalm 19.1 that you have heavens and skies. Those are parallel ideas. Declare and proclaims the uh, a parallel idea. And the glory of God and the work of his hands are parallel ideas. Also, here we have the fear of the Lord. Uh, and knowledge are parallel beginning of wisdom and understanding of parallels. Psalm 15, 1, who, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, may live in your holy city. We find that those are parallel ideas as well. There is also incomplete parallelism. Sometimes the second line isn't a complete parallel to the first, and this is called incomplete parallelism. For example, Psalm 24, 1, 
The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the Lord and all who live in it. It's obvious to see that while the second line does not include is the Lord's, it is implied. Another one is Proverbs 19.29. Penalties are prepared for markers and beatings for the backs of bulls. You can see how those incomplete ideas uh, are yet somewhat parallel. The antithetic parallelism, this type of parallelism is easy to recognize. The two lines sharply contrast each other, and usually there's a conjunction that provides the clue. For example, Psalm 1 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Proverbs 10 2. You've gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 10 4. Lazy hands make a poor man, but diligent hands bring wealth. Synthetic parallelism. This form of parallelism rebuilds the second line, normally completing the thought that the first line left incomplete. The two lines stand in a relationship that's not clearly defined, like that in synonymous and antithetic parallelism. Now, some scholars question whether this is really parallelism at all. But look at Psalm 1 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, where after many days you will find it again. So we go from parallelism to chiism. And this is another literary form found in Hebrew poetry. The term chiism is derived from the Greek letter chi, which is taken or written like the letter X. This occurs when successive lines of poetry revert, reverse the order in which the parallel themes appear. They appear to be crisscrossing each other. For example, you have A, O Lord, B, forgive me. And then you have a repeated idea of B, blot out my sin, and then A, O God of my salvation. So here you see the two A's are parallel thoughts and the two B's are parallel thoughts. It's called an ABBA pattern. There's more complex patterns can occur in ABCBA, sometimes in ABCCBA. Another one that uh, we find in Hebrew poetry is uh, acrostics. Now, these are uh, alphabetic poems, and so uh, we're, we're, we're encouraged to think about. Uh, write in a poem with 26 lines to it. I mean, since we have 26 letters in our uh, English alphabet, first line would begin with an A, the second with the B, third line with the C, and so forth. The genius of this type of poetry is not only to be able to write a line that begins with the next letter of the alphabet, but to ensure that you stay on the same topic and fit it all together. Probably the most famous example of an acrostic Hebrew poetry is found in Psalm 119. The first eight verses begin with an Allah. Verses 9 through 16 begin with Bet, the second letter, and that continues throughout the song. Now, many may be aware of someone. I'm sorry. Many may be aware of Psalm 119, but not many are aware of Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. It's also a poem describing the virtuous woman and uses this, this acrostic style with the Hebrew alphabet. So in conclusion, the Hebrew poetical books have influenced the Christian faith profoundly. For example, Job teaches us about why righteous people sometimes suffer very trying situations. Psalms provides many songs that invite us to sing and worship the ancient God of Israel. Proverbs provides timeless truths that are expressed in very memorial ways. Ecclesiastes helps us understand the meaning of life and that only a personal relationship with God makes it. And finally, the Song of Psalms teaches us the joy that a love and romantic joy of love with a romantic love poem.